My joy has come from letting go of the need to generate wealth. The essence of kindness, particularly kindness in business, is just acknowledging the humanity of business, acknowledging that it's not just dollars uh, and cents, it's not just ones and zeros, it's not just code. Try to invest in keeping score a little bit less and try to invest more in just believing that if we put good out into the world, that good will come back to us. Let's paint a picture of a world you want to live in and let's start working towards that world. A lot of people, including myself, are going through or went through a certain motion or a crisis in the past. Has anyone talked about their transformational journey openly? I don't think so. Sam Jacobs, Wall Street best-selling author, CEO of Pavilion and the host of Sales Hacker Podcast joins me today to talk about his journey to discovering kindness, answers the question of why kind folks finish first and share his honest story of spiritual transformation that enabled him to reach success and at last live a happy life. Thank you for tuning into this one. Enjoy the episode. I wanted to kick this off, Sam, with, uh, with the following. I think you are familiar with the words, for those who believe in a better way to do business. I am familiar with those words. <laughs> yeah. What is a better way? Well, the core, there's three core elements uh, to the ideas behind uh, the company that I run, Pavilion. And I don't think that I'm perfect at these ideas, but I think that they are a North Star. They are aspirational. Uh, build relationships, not transactions. Uh, focus on uh, playing uh, a big, long game versus a, a short, small game. Those, And don't assume that the world is zero sum. Believe in a world of abundance. Those are sort of the core ideas. And so for me, a better way to do business is one that tries to tries to emulate those ideas. I have challenges with other people sometimes, and maybe they have challenges with me, is, is, is being transactional, is assuming that, you know, I need something from somebody, therefore uh, I should go to them and get it and not invest in a relationship and not invest in the long term. And, and correspondingly, when somebody needs something from me, they show up, I never hear from them again. Um, and all of our interactions feel like they're robbing us of, I guess, in some ways, our humanity. And so the point uh, of, you know, what I'm trying to teach people, and again, sometimes I'm good at it and sometimes I'm not, and there's nuances and moments when you have to exercise judgment. But the right. real point is that let's invest in helping other people. Let's invest in taking phone calls at all at off hours and not necessarily needing to send somebody an invoice. Let's try to invest in keeping score a little bit less and try to invest more in just believing that if we put good out into the world, uh, that good will come back to us. And, you know, there's a phrase that my coach and I regularly refer to, which is mm -hmm. to he or she or they, however you identify, but to them who have much more shall be given. And the point is that I believe that the way that the universe works and the way that markets work and the way that human relationships work is that we are attracted to gratitude and to um, optimism and to abundance. We are attracted. When people don't need things from us, we are attracted to them. When people need things from us and when they want and when they come from a place of need, anxiety, and desperation, we are in many ways repelled by them. In the same way that if you're courting a romantic partner when you're young, uh, you understand that your desperation has an inverse relationship to your likelihood mm -hmm. of success. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that's true in many parts of the world. And I particularly find it true in business when people understand. And I have so many recent experiences from uh, my personal life mm -hmm. uh, when people are short sighted and they're not playing for a longer relationship or a longer perspective. Everybody notices and mm -hmm. uh, their opinion and their contributions become discounted. So. A better way to do business is build relationship, not transactions, focus on the long term, not the short term, and really try to employ gratitude and abundance and harmony uh, into your into your life on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You speak and uh, write about a lot about kindness, especially about discovering kindness. Um, can you tell me about your journey to discover kindness to frame up our conversation? Yeah. Uh, and, and to the point, you know, my book is called Kind Folks Finish First. And 
you sent me that lovely picture of you reading it. So that was, a, that was an honor. Uh, kindness is not niceness. So we can start there. Kindness is, is, is effectively, again, what's the difference between regular business or, or more traditional business and some of the ideas I articulate? It, sometimes you hear, you know, uh, it's a doggy dog world and you need to make sure that you, that every negotiation is, is a war, right? And that you have to win the negotiation. And kindness is embodying the ideas that I literally, ju- that I just referenced, which is, it's not a war. And we can believe that other people have good intentions and are trying to do good. And we don't have to um, extract every last ounce of value from every interaction or negotiation. And we can just try to put good things into the world and not always charge for them, not always be, again, transactional. Uh, So I find that really the essence of kindness, particularly kindness in business, is just acknowledging the humanity of business, acknowledging that it's not just dollars uh, and cents. It's not just ones and zeros. It's not just code. But these are real human beings and and living creatures more Mm -hmm. than even human beings because it's not just about humans. But it's about how we, the footprint that we leave on the world and how we interact with other people. And again, this is not to... I'm trying to come from it from an authentic place, which means I recognize my fallibility mm-hmm. personally. Right. And I recognize that sometimes people view some of my decisions as unkind mm-hmm. and I'm not holding myself up as mother Teresa, but I am merely saying that these are ideas and lessons that I've learned and they helped build the company that I currently run. And so to the point, what was the journey? My journey, uh, you know, began, well, it obviously began 46 years ago, uh, you know, in my mother's womb, but uh, or 46 years ago in nine months, but, um, or 10 months at this point. Uh, but um, really my startup journey began in 2003. I had run a record label. I then moved back to New York in 2003 and I worked at a company called Gerson Lerman Group. And I achieved a good amount of early success uh, for a relatively young person. And in, in, in 2003, I was, you know, 25, 26. And, um, and I rose up very quickly. And then I became a, a senior executive at startups after that. So I was at this place, GLG, for seven and a half years. And then really uh, after GLG from 2010 to 2018, I was a senior executive at very early stage companies, trying to help them grow, trying to help them get off the ground. And um, I, I was fired a lot and I had uh, some difficulties and I don't uh, remember it as a period of particular happiness for me. And I got divorced and uh, had some financial issues. And the journey, the point of the book is that uh, I, in some ways, you know, I, I always worked pretty hard and I always wanted, I had high ambitions, but my approach uh, came from a place of neediness and of desperation and of anxiety. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the point of the book and the point of this idea of kindness, and Mm -hmm. again, I recognize this is not a statistically significant sample. So I can't, I can't point to a scientific study published in, you know, journal that articulates the R squared of this hypothesis. But the point, my point was that over the course of 15 years, what I had been doing on the side was bringing people together. I had started this community that is now called Pavilion. I had hosted dinners, but the point wasn't the dinners or the mm-hmm. events. The point was the ethos that underpinned what we were trying to do. And the ethos that underpinned what we were trying to do was mutual support, was in many ways uh, the modern version of a guild or uh, a kind of a new version of a union in some ways. But it was really about helping my colleagues and my friends who were all in similar situations to me uh, achieve their professional goals, achieve the outcomes that they were Mm -hmm. looking for. And that's important because in the world in which we operate, which was typically venture capital backed high growth companies, uh, those goals are oft talked about and oft discussed, but not always easy to achieve. And uh, the basics of how to understand the value of your equity, how to understand how to negotiate for compensation, what you're allowed to ask for and what you're not allowed to ask for, how you should think about building a consulting business, how you should think about revenue diversification. All of these things contribute to your ability as an executive to lead a fulfilling and productive career. Mm -hmm. But they weren't 
uh, well distributed and well communicated. And, uh, and that, that was where I found a lot of joy. I found a lot of joy in helping people uh, improve their position. I found a lot of joy in connecting people to uh, uh, an introduction and realizing later that they had found a job. I, I found joy in helping people and explicitly not intentionally not trying to charge them, mm-hmm. right? Intentionally not saying, I'm not going to be a recruiter. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to ask for 10% of this introduction. I am intentionally going to help you and expect nothing in return. And I did that. And when I finally, and this was in 2017, when I finally uh, sort of reflected, and I did this with a coach, I didn't Mm -hmm. just do all of this on my own. When I reflected on why, what it was about that experience that I took joy from, I also realized that, um, Pursuing that path uh, was really the turning point in my life. You spoke about the, your journey, right? I'm also interested to understanding um, uh, your journey of discovering uh, kindness in terms of, um, you know, where you've been as a person back then before you kind of discovered it. And what was sort of like you're going through in your life um, when you have that or need for the moment of sort of like discovering something more important that was you, right? So I, uh, again, uh, the journey of discovering this core principle that you were building on, uh, again, your philosophy and your, you know, perception of things, obviously it's a bit different from, um, you know, from just kind of events that are happening in your life. So if you can um, just spend a minute and if we can go back and you can paint for me that sort of like that journey that you had, either spiritually or sort of like emotionally or sort of like what was you going through at that point in life that you had the need to kind of grasp that kind of new, more high value kind of principle in your life? Well, uh, s- s- sort of to the point, it was a, it was a funk, you know, uh, the definition of, uh, as they say, and I Sometimes hear this attributed to Albert Einstein, but it doesn't sound like him, but I could be wrong. Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And and I had struggled, you know, I I, I, I live in, I lived, you know, I actually, as of this moment, do not have an apartment in New York City, although, you know, we are debating, debating that. But I had, I'd lived in New York. I've lived in New York and the surrounding area right. uh, since 2003, mm-hmm. right? So 20 years wow. now. And uh, New York is a money dominated culture. Mm-hmm. And I am a very ambitious person that has some kind of an inferiority complex, mm-hmm. uh, complex. And like all human beings and like you know you can read about it in psychology books, but you know I pursue uh, status. And, and particularly relative status, mm-hmm. meaning I compare myself to my friends and to my peers. And I'm, and, and so, so in, in New York, uh, where the dominant industries for most of my time there and the, the, the path to wealth, and, and it's a place where, uh, you know, you get, you get infected in a right. way, you know, you become very intent on wealth generation and wealth creation, and you measure your worth based mm-hmm. on how much money you have. And I had been around, and GLG was a company that sold to hedge funds mm-hmm. in the golden age of hedge funds uh, before, you know, a bunch of the people that we sold to went to jail. But, um, and so they were, you know, so you're surrounded by, by young millionaires and right. by people that are making uh, tremendous amounts of money. And, and I was making less. And at the same time, I went, I went through a divorce in 2009 and 2010 that really left me pretty damaged financially. And I started joining these companies and these companies, and I would work myself up. And really, again, that coming from that place of desperation, constantly doing calculations on my percentage ownership of the company times an exit value to understand mm-hmm. how was I going to, how was I going to make money? And I even go, I have a, a document, you know, Google doc that I've been keeping for 10 years now where I write, I sort of reflect on my mm-hmm. life once to twice a year. Mm-hmm. And even in that document, you can read it and you can read this tremendous financial stress and this pressure of trying to keep up with my friends who are in finance and keep up with my peers and feeling like I wasn't making enough progress Mm -hmm. and living beyond my means in many cases. 
So that's the energy that right. I would bring. You know, the energy that I would bring uh, to an interaction would be one of disappointment, right? Uh, you would say, "How's it going?" and and I would feel. Um, I would feel in some way less than even in the act of you asking me. Mm -hmm. And I would always, I would work up and there's the sense of frustration because, you know, when you join a startup, when you join a high growth company, you know, you start, you have to work yourself up to this big idea that this is going to be the one. Right. And it kept happening that I would work myself up to this idea and it wasn't the one. Mm -hmm. And I would spend all of my time and energy trying to create enterprise value and it, wasn't working and it mm -hmm. wasn't successful. And, um, and I remember going, you know, going for a run with a good friend of mine and my, and I, he said, how's it going? And I said, you know, and I was my usual half hearted slash less enthusiastic slash frustrated self. And, you know, he asked this question, does it help? Mm -hmm. And I asked, what does what help? He said, always being negative, always having something, right. never being proud of your accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he said, and I said, that's a funny way of, of asking it. Cause I don't think it does. And his point mm -hmm. was, even if you don't have a high opinion of yourself or aren't kind to yourself, uh, the act of being kind to yourself might generate better results for you than uh, being unkind to yourself. And that's an important part of the book actually, mm -hmm. which is that part of kind folks finish first, the, the first person that you need to be kind to is yourself. And that's also a big change, uh, for me. And, uh, and it was something that I learned again, you know, particularly I remember, um, you know, it happened pretty much as soon as I, as soon as I left uh, in 2017, but really I just remember a sense of freedom and joy that comes from, um, working at a, you know, building a successful, profitable business and not having any responsibilities. And that was particularly true during COVID when, you know, I was working from home, but Pavilion was growing very significantly. And of course, you know, there was tremendous capital sloshing around and, and we were seeing tremendous growth. But the point of what I'm saying is that, you know, for the first time I had let go of, you know, my joy uh, has come uh, from letting go of the need to generate wealth. And, and you know, perhaps, uh, I don't know if it's ironic or just coincidental, but whatever it is, when I finally let go of needing wealth and, and chasing something and chasing something for somebody else. And when I just accepted, because you have to understand Pavilion is effectively originally a dinner business, right? These are not high, these are services businesses or could be thought of in that way. Services businesses that are, uh, that are you know, ha reasonable margins, but not software margins. The point is, this is not, I never thought of this as a world conquering ambition. This was just a way this was a job I couldn't be fired from. And I just remember the sense of joy and freedom, particularly during COVID, despite all of the other tragedies that were happening, but working on this thing where I didn't need it to be anything other than a thing that could pay my rent. And, uh, and, and it did, and it could. And that was a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And, and, you know, yeah, I wrote this book, uh, and it, you know, I wrote it a year and a half ago or a year plus ago, and it came out now about a year ago. And, uh, and in the last year, I've had to rediscover some of the very lessons that I share with other people, you know, happiness and gratitude, um, and kindness are not, uh, static states. They're dynamic states. They can come and go. What it is actually letting go in your kind of personal or professional life besides sort of like working on that project that by default you didn't think that's going to generate uh, a lot of wealth for you it's just something that you were passionate about right something that you really uh, found joy in right letting go first of all uh relates to presence that's one of the things that it relates to right when you're when you are attached right uh to an outcome you need so you know my coach calls it being condition driven condition driven we don't want that that means that i am not allowed to be happy unless certain things happen Right. And what you realize from Buddhism or from really most spiritual practices, even from Christ, I'm Jewish, but doesn't matter, um, or from Eckhart Tolle or from anybody, is that um, happiness doesn't have to be condition driven. It shouldn't be. Uh, happiness is possible anytime you want. You just have to choose it. And that's also the point of Michael Singer's book, The Untethered Soul, which was a big book for me at the beginning of COVID when I read it in January of 2020, which is that you you simply make a commitment to being happy right now, right here. And that's very, very hard. And, and why is that hard? Because 
we, we are condition driven and our mind is con constantly active telling us that uh, there are conditions around, we are not allowed to be happy unless, and that's a trap. That's a trap because the unless is never now, right? The unless is not right now. Uh, unless is always not now, as Eckhart would say, right? All it is, is not now. The point of all of these conditions, like I have to sell the company for X amount of money, or I need to make this much money to compete with so-and-so. All of that is a way of saying you are not allowed to be happy right now. And so the first thing you need to do is to realize that part of letting go is to realize that you are free to be happy anytime you want. It's up to you and it's not up to anybody else. And that's incredibly empowering actually, because it means that it's not up to anybody else. It's up to you. And so that's, so one of the ways that you quote unquote, let go is mm -hmm. by losing the need for certain outcomes in order to justify whatever emotion you seek to feel. I would say additionally, there's this concept of high participation, low attachment. Mm -hmm. And again, all of it is that, you know, you have to, I think happiness is both uh, an act of being incredibly present and, right. and not letting your mind make you crazy, either with regret from the past or fear of the future. But it's also a leap of faith. It's also a closing of the eyes. It's also a, a, a way... People want, you know, they want to recreate the success that I've had with Pavilion and they ask me about it sometimes. And my answer is, you know, part of the success of Pavilion was that I didn't need it to be successful. Right. And, the, and again, need and desperation is the thing that often pushes success away. Mm -hmm. So the other part of letting go is that leap of faith, that leap of faith of trusting that you are doing something that feels true. You know, you can call it flow state or whatever you want, but there's certain things in life. There's certain things that we all do where we are all so full of insecurities. And yet there's a certain moments when we are completely confident and we're confident because we've moved past the fear of uh, how others perceive us, the fear that we are not you know, popular, cool, well-liked, whatever, because we're doing something that's beyond that. We just know my friend Brandon is a chef. He runs a, he runs a food uh, company as well. He runs a, a food technology company. And uh, he came over uh, to, uh, to show me to do some cooking lessons because I'm trying to get into cooking. And, um, and that, that is a place where he is, there's no self-consciousness. He knows what good food is. He has a point of view on it. He doesn't have a lot of doubt. I actually write a lot of songs Songwriting is an area where I don't have a lot of self-consciousness. I know when a song is good and I really don't, it doesn't matter to me whether other people think it's good or not. I have better taste than most people in music when it comes to music. And my point is all of us have those things, those things that we're passionate about, that we understand, that we know we're good at. And if you can pursue those things, then it's a leap of faith around how will the universe, you know, um, conspire to find you success. And so, again, for me, running Pavilion, connecting people, helping people, running a good event, making sure that people feel included, uh, being a good host, that's something that comes very naturally to me. I don't need anybody's suggestions on how to run a dinner party. I know how to run a dinner party. The last thing I will say is, um, as I mentioned, there's this concept of high participation, low attachment. And again, high participation means... None of this is, uh, you know, a, a framework for, um, for being lazy, sadly, right? Hard work is always going to be part because the way to make, you know, the, the way to realize your vision is to act, is to take action, take decisive action. And it's that, you know, the, the parable or the joke or whatever from, you know, the guy that drowns in the ocean and he had, had a, a boat come by and a life preserver sit, float by and he goes to God and he says, you God didn't save me. And he says, well, I sent you a boat. I sent you a life preserver. So the point is that you have to take action. But if you're willing to take action, high participation, that's what it means. Be invested in the work. And then low attachment. Low attachment means I do the work, I trust the process, and whatever happens from there, uh, if, if exactly what I want doesn't happen, something better than that will happen. And again, that's about letting go. I don't need to fixate. For me, 
as a as a as a as a as a CEO, right? That the attachment, the condition driven thinking would be: if I don't sell my company for a hundred million dollars, I can't be happy, right? And I'm really fixated on that, and I really want to sell my company, and that's not a useful. That is the energy that pushes. Even if I wanted that outcome, it pushes that outcome away. The, the thing that brings that it, literally the attractive force is you being content and happy in exactly where you are in this moment right now. And again, I'm not perfect at that at all, but I will tell you, I'm a lot better. I'm a lot better than I've ever been in my life. And I've faced some challenges with this company this year. And I've been in this practice of saying, why is this perfect? No matter what happens, right? In this journey of uh, spiritual transformation, who helped you? Um, and um, also, I'm, I would love to understand the role of, of your work versus the other people helping you in this transformation, if you can speak to this. I'd been working with a coach, and the coach's name is John Mark Shaw. John Shaw, and I've referred probably a hundred clients to him at this point, and he is the hero of this story. And I'd been working with a therapist who should not, who shall go unnamed, is a very kind person, a very kind person, and I really have affection for him. I had been seeing this therapist for maybe 10 years, uh, maybe longer at that point, maybe 12 years, maybe 13 years, a very long time. And what would happen in my therapy sessions? I would go into those sessions and we would talk about and from this was my experience with this therapist, not therapy in general. My experience with this therapist was uh, he was an advocate for me. That's great. And we were trying to uncover reasons for my uh, shortcomings, my dissatisfaction, my unhappiness. And inevitably, those reasons uh, were other people. Well, it was issues from my childhood. It was my parents' fault. fault. Uh, it was my sister's fault. It was my wife's fault. And it was really a process of understanding, trying to understand myself by figuring out who to blame for my pain. Right. And I would go in there and I told, I remember because, you know, we were separated. We've since reconciled, mm -hmm. but we were separated. And I would, and I, I, I remember thinking, I'm, I don't want to get divorced again. You know, I've already been divorced right. once. Right. And uh, I remember uh, going in one time and, and saying, you know, I'm not, tell me if I'm crazy, but, you know, my wife did this. Am I crazy? And, and, and that is, that's a very problematic mm -hmm. interaction with the, regardless of whether the, and, and I, anyway, his point was the, the answer to my, from my therapist was, no, you're not crazy. And here's the point. The point was, how do you feel when you leave? And how did I feel? I usually felt angry mm -hmm. when I left. I felt angry because I felt like I needed to go show my wife that I was the boss and that she needed to listen to me. And that and, and then meanwhile, mm -hmm. and so I found therapy very backwards looking and very, it conjured up. So, so what was the, what was the inflection point? The catalyst, the catalyst was my, uh, sitting on top of this hotel and, and thinking about how my coach was never backwards looking, but only forwards looking. My coach wasn't interested in figuring out what my mom or dad did wrong for the reasons why I wasn't happy. My coach was saying, well, what world do you want to live in? Let's paint a picture of a world you want to live in and let's start working towards that world. And let's start coming in, as opposed to a place of frustration and disappointment and anger. Let's come from a place of abundance and happiness and optimism and gratitude. And that so you, the original question was, you know, who's helped me in my journey? He helped me a tremendous amount. And, and, it, and it is that mindset with which I try to embody the work that I'm doing with Pavilion. Not always perfect, but that that specific person, John, um, was, was really transformational, uh, because we talk every Saturday and, and all it is, is a touch base to check in and recharge your batteries and try to reconnect to the good parts of your energy and your life force and your soul. Well, and then the work that you had to put in is to show up be disciplined, be consistent, be open. And um, are there any other kind of rituals or practices that you had to do to, uh, you know, working with a coach to, uh, you know, to again, to that help you to levy that kind of transformation that, that you were going through? I mean, I think uh, open-mindedness, right. I mean, again, like the, the, the specific tactical work, journaling, meditation, talking to a coach, using a forward-looking coach, um, trying to put these ideas into practice, self-compassion, so trying to say to yourself out loud, I love you, you know, as much as you can. That's the specific, those are the specifics of, you know, the work. The, 
the mindset has to be one of open-mindedness. The mindset has to be, um, we don't know everything that's happening in the universe. And, and I'm not ready to dismiss all of these ideas because they haven't been tested in a, in a, in a laboratory. They've been tested in the laboratory of, you know, the human condition. And, um, and I need to be open to the possibility that magic is, is, is possible in this world. And I need to be open to the possibility that um, our perception is, I mean, these are not even possibilities. This is true, right? Reality, as we experience it as humans, is an act of uh, hallucination, right? We're getting way more data uh, through, first of all, none of the things that we experience as senses are actually, it all goes to the brain first and the brain creates the reality. It creates this little portal through which you're looking, looking into the world, but that's not the world. This is our version of the world. So once you, okay, if that's true, then is it manipulatable? Can we manipulate it to, to achieve certain outcomes? And if you believe, and this is related in some ways to, you know, aliens and, the Fermi paradox and panpsychism and is consciousness an inherent element of the universe or created by humans. But my point is there's something going on that we don't understand that's bigger than us. And I believe that. And I believe that I'm not, I don't, I'm not equipped to have all of the answers to all of the questions. And I'm going to trust that something bigger is going on. And I'm going to lean into some of these ideas that even if I can't prove them in a laboratory, they make me feel good. You know, I think yeah. there's, I've listened to, uh, uh, I forget the guy's name, but you know, the, there's a bunch of famous podcasters and they often, uh, you know, they often, th there's an analysis of whether I think it's Sam Harris, mm -hmm. uh, but there's an analysis of, you know, is free will possible? And, um, uh, there's a lot of logical explanations why free will is a complete illusion and mm -hmm. why, you know, it's fact, it's logically impossible to right. believe that everything isn't predetermined in some way. And my answer to that is who cares, right? right? Because it's more fun to believe that it's that free will exists. So I'm going to believe it because mm -hmm. I don't, nobody is <laughs> knocking at my door, giving me a fine for believing that free will is an illusion. And my point is, even if none of this stuff is true, I enjoy the world where I believe it to be true better than the one that it's not. I just uh, this morning had a, a certain like uh, a short clip on YouTube about the the Shaolin monarch uh, t talking or giving lecture about the life, and he was telling that we are thinking about the the sense of life too too often instead of just living through it and and, and making actions and enjoying it, right? And that's the point of it, right? That's the point of what we are giving to go through that motion, enjoy and be you know enjoy it every time. Um, I will move on to another, uh, another topic, um, uh, just something to close up on this block of um, journey of the spiritual transformation. So in one of your posts, I think, or, or one of the articles, you've mentioned that you went through two transformations. And I wanted to chat not about the second one, 2017, starting Pavilion, but you mentioned that the first transformation that you had back in 2010, when you were 33 years old, was the time you became a man. Mm -hmm. And this is something that resonates me a, a lot because I'm going through that motion right now. And I've talked to a few guests about those different cycle or different stages in their life. And some people say that when you become a man, that's the, 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 the second stage of your life where you go from the child, from the youngster to kind of to being actually adult. So can you walk me through that? What was that transformation about and what what is your understanding at that point of sort of like becoming a man? That's a great question. Um, his, up to that point, I guess it was moving from a period of uh, a space of entitlement uh, to a space of agency. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? I, I'm, you know, I'm reasonably smart. Um, not a genius, but I'm articulate. I can communicate. And I, I could have done better. <laughs> I went to a good school, a good university, but I could have gone to a better university if I had worked a little harder, if I'd specifically worked harder on my college applications. I, I am not saying this to, to be unkind to myself. I am saying that there was always great potential within me. And, um, and I never 
had the work ethic, to be completely honest, to bring it out. Or, or yeah, I, I, it's some something about um, what I expected from the world and how hard it was to achieve. And uh, when I went to work at this place, GLG, Gerson Lehrman Group, um, you know, that company went from 25 million to 300 million over a very short time. And uh, I was paid very large amounts of money as a late 20s person. You know, there's one year I made, I think, $800,000. And I was like 28 years old. And, um, you know, I saved very little of it, of course. But the point is that it all sort of came easily. And there was a disconnect. And so when I left GLG, which was 2010, this is when I became a man, because it was effectively the wake of the financial crisis. And, you know, when GLG went through a period where over two years, they cut my pay almost by two thirds. And why did they do that? They did that because, uh, because I couldn't anchor my contributions to enterprise value, to unique enterprise value in a way that was definitive, which, which is a way of saying that I didn't deserve it or a way of saying I got lucky. And getting lucky is great. Uh, I'm still lucky. I consider myself extremely lucky. But the point is I became a man when I started to build material useful skills that I understood had commercial value and I took responsibility for them and for that hard work. And I lost a lot of things that I had taken for granted. I lived, I moved, you know, I was, I went from making, you know, I don't know, uh, close to $400,000 a year to making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Now, again, it depends where you are. If you're in Poland listening to this, that's a lot of money. If you're in New York city in Manhattan, it's not a lot of money. And I had to radically change my lifestyle. And I, you know, I had to move somewhere else to a much smaller part and to a much place, you know, moved to Brooklyn and, um, and, you know, thought I had earned a certain amount of wealth and it was taken from me by my ex-wife. And I never thought I'd get divorced. And she filed for divorce and told me over a voicemail. And there was, it was a lot of pain. It was a lot of loss and it stripped me down and it forced me to stand up and to become to take control and to, and, and to, to not shrink, but mm -hmm. to stand and rise to the challenge. And that's, I guess what I mean by becoming yeah. a man. And, and also the recognition that to the point of like the long term, that whatever path I was going to pursue, it was not going to happen overnight. And that this was, I, it was time to get to work. And, um, you know, I, um, a lot of other things, you know, began, that was when I began running. You know, yeah. uh, that's when I lost 20 pounds. I weigh about 25 pounds less than I used to weigh, you know, 13 years ago. Uh, and again, it was when I said, I got to start taking this thing seriously. This is life. You know, you get one chance at it. And that's what I mean. Well, you mentioned that you were moodiness, you have a moodiness and you were very emotional. And then that effect that your ability to work with others. And that resonates with um, a few people that I know in, in my, um, in my network. Um, can you speak to how did this um, moodiness and abundance of emotion that you had sort of like affected your work, professional work with others? And then um, if you can talk to and then you mentioned that you're working on this and now you're much better than you were before. So what was the work that you went through um, and um, just kind of, you know, your message to the people that are in a similar character that you have um, as sort of like you being on two sides of, of this and then you already going through certain work and being on the other side of, of and seeing the outcomes of that work. If you can speak to that, that would be perfect. I'm up and down. And, um, the feed, it has a big impact and I've gotten feedback on this my entire life, but really the, especially my professional life when I'm in a good mood, things are great. I can bring, I'm contagious, you know, my energy is contagious and I can, I can lighten people's spirits and lighten their loads with my, with my infectious energy. And when I'm dour or depressed, um, and who knows why, maybe it was, I didn't get a good night's sleep. Maybe I'm hungover. Maybe I'm just crabby, but if I'm depressed, it affects the people that I work with as well. And so that can be, as a leader, it's a very problematic uh, tendency because it, it means that the mood of the organization can shift dramatically. I find that your personality traits, um, they're like a Brita water filter. They're like a water filtration system. 
and um, your your they can be a layer be, be between which um, your thoughts pass, and you're not aware that that's what's happening. And so my point is, if your thoughts pass through a negative filtration system, then your thoughts emerge as negative thoughts. Now, if you're not aware that that's your tendency, you don't know that your thoughts. So what I mean is you can, if you're smart, you can logically provide an argument as to why the world really is terrible. And you can say, yeah, Sam, I get it. You know, I hear that you're telling me to be happy. And I hear that you're saying that happiness is available for me, but that's easy for you to say, you don't know my situation. And my situation is objectively fucked. And, uh, and, and that's just true. Now, if my situation were different, I could see being happy, but my situation is inarguably bad. And here's my supporting points for why. And what you don't under, and this is particularly true in relationships, right? How many people have we, yes, relationships are 50, 50, but that person is completely wrong and an asshole and an idiot. And I am correct. And they're doing me dirty. And I have no, I have no you know, this is no fault of mine that any of these bad things are happening. And of course it's not true, but you don't believe it because it all feels like a very logical argument that's being made in your head. And what you don't realize is that all of the arguments in your head are completely uh, arbitrary and they are completely the result of, as Eckhart Tolle would say, your egoic mind. And you have to question the foundational filtration layer the thing that forms your thoughts into negative articulations and formations before they even become your thoughts. And that's super, super hard. And that is most present and most common in romantic relationships because those are the highest stakes relationships that we have. And so you have this thing of like, I can't believe she doesn't do this. I can't believe he doesn't do that. I can't believe he doesn't understand me well enough to understand that that was a terrible thing to say. And all of this feels so true right. and so resonant. And you don't realize that it's all BS, that most of the time, nobody's trying to hurt you. Nobody's yeah. intentionally trying to undermine you. They're just wrapped up in their own thing. They think that you're the enemy and you think that they're the enemy. And you have to, so the work of going deeper than that is very hard. Very hard because what you're talking about, that filtration system, that's your DNA. You know, that's, that, that's the core reaction and impulses that are created from when you were very young. So how do you change it? It takes a lot of work, a lot of work. And I don't necessarily mean therapy. I mean, recognizing the emotion, recognizing the trigger, understanding, oh, I'm angry now. Why am I angry? What is it that's making me angry? Mm -hmm. And it being much more introspective. That is the path to at least awareness of your behavior, awareness that, you know what, you're not perfect and, and you're not a victim either. You know, we're all just participants. Yeah. That's the most important, not to closing up from the world and showing your authenticity and uh, so that you are personal and that you, who, you, you, who you are and then embracing yourself. And as you spoke about times and times to, throughout our conversations, um, you know, sh showing yourself compassion, not being hard on yourself and, and sort of like embracing the nature of who you actually are, which is beautiful, right? Because that's the uniqueness of, of who you are and that's what helped you to get to where you are. And again, um, the energy that you give away as a result of this embracing is far more beneficial to you. It's like, you know, very often when you see a person being confident in themselves and how they're behaving, how they're like sharing that sort of like whatever energy you have. But if you're like sharing that and being honest about it, people see that and they attach themselves to it, right? Because there's there's so many people that are, can relate to what we are talking right now and that they can understand the mood is their moodiness and they like that right they like different kicks and 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 different weirdness and different strength and etc right so uh, that's life right um i want to move on to this nagus block and i'm the reason i want to specifically ask this question to you directly is that you're one of the the guests of this season who truly worked on himself and then who actually open up about his experience and you show that on your post on your book and it's very beneficial for a lot of people because a lot of us going through that same motion, that worry that we're doing, but sometimes because we don't talk about it openly, we there's so many people that do that, but then they, we don't know about that, right? And 
I, I like the way you kind of structure um, your this little different rituals and, and personal practices. And um, you mentioned a few already, but then I want to understand what are you doing on an early, monthly, weekly and daily basis if this is just ongoing for you? OK, well, the the mostly it's daily, you know, it's so daily. I have a I have a spreadsheet that's called my good day spreadsheet. And it's got a few different things on it. One of them is meditation, exercise, uh, being kind to others, journaling, and um, I think that's it. And then maybe like drinking a certain amount of water. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just try to check the box when I do those things. I also know that you incorporate resolutions. Uh, did you stop doing that? Are you still doing it? I do uh, more than different than resolutions. I try to do what I would consider to be visioning. So what I do is... At the end of the year, between Christmas and New Year's, first I do an annual reflection. And what I really try to do is like write down all my favorite memories so that I can like remember them because <laughs> my brain is bad. Uh, and then and then I try to do a visioning exercise. Some, some people call it future casting. And that's where I put myself into the future. And I say, I'm so happy and grateful that now it's XYZ time. But what I need to do a better job of is spending time with that vision every day. The key part of the exercise is that you are you are not hoping for the future. You are reflecting from the future on the past. You are acting as if it had already happened. And again, that's that it's the same kind of idea as not focusing on need or desperation. You don't need it to happen. You're not so desperate. You're not praying to God. It already happened. So how does it feel? Let's reflect on how it feels in your body. Let's reflect on the steps you took. Let's reflect on the challenges. But you did it. You did it. Here we are, and you did it. And um, yeah, that's 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 one of my key goal setting exercises. Uh, you mentioned that, and I resonate with this completely. Twenty twenty three sucks. Like sucks a lot for everyone. It's 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 been tough for, on everyone, especially on the businesses. Um, for us, it's, it's worse than the previous year. And although the previous year war in Ukraine started and I'm Ukrainian, two years in a row is just, um, battling the reality and, and just looking and working with your perception and again, creating the perception of the world that you want to live in, in the next five, 10 years and not, you know, being present with all, whatever scarities are happening right now. But, um, and again, resonate completely with 2023 being a, a very challenging year. I, w I want to understand what was your vision for yourself for 2023 and where are you at against that vision and against those goals? When I started, I thought it would go better than it's gone. Now I'm in a, I mean, I, the, the economy is, you know, one of my uh, investors said, I think you're going to see churn numbers that'll make your stomach uh, turn uh, by the middle of the summer. This was at the beginning of the year. And um, that's not quite what happened, but it's been really, really challenging. Um, and and yet, something about, something has happened in the last month. I mean, here's honestly, the, the, the big thing that's happened is the following. Um, I'm getting better at being a CEO. And what I mean by that is I'm getting better at long-term planning. And I never understood the importance of long-term planning as much as I understand over the past year. And we have been on a process of reinvigorating our the business. And we made a bunch of big mistakes, big, big mis mistakes. And we are reversing those mistakes. And that takes time. And, you know, one of my other board members said, it's not clear that we truly understand what the business is. And I understand the business better than I ever have. And what I can go into great detail, but we're running a little short on time and I do have a dog that needs dinner. But um, tell me but about I the mistakes. I, knew, I should ask this. What were the mistakes? Uh, people, you know, again, I, I made, I can tell you about my big mistake that I did, one of the biggest in my career this year well, as well. So here, here's, again, this speaks to like, what is the company, right? And we haven't even talked about my company. So for out there listening, if you're listening, uh, I run a company called Pavilion. We're the largest community for go-to-market executives, meaning sales, marketing, customer success, CEOs, and founders, people that build revenue, run revenue for high growth companies in the world, 10,000 people all over the world. We had grown uh, to this size 
largely uh, because we had people in different cities that were chapter heads and they were organizers of local community. And unlike EO or YPO, which are similar organizations, we paid people, we paid them very, very well. And last year, as we headed into the recession, we saw slowing growth and slightly declining net promoter score. And we said, you know what the problem is? The problem is these chapters that were paying too much money to these chapter heads, these community leaders, paying too much money, and we're not getting enough back from it. And what we need to do is centralize everything. We can run everything. We can run all the events. We can do all the recruiting. We can do it. And we can, can deliver a consistent brand experience because we will be doing everything. Right. And um, so we fired all of them and we replaced them with these very strange uh, uh, groups that we had made up in our own heads that we mm -hmm. really hadn't asked anybody's feedback on. And that has been an absolute disaster, absolute disaster. And what was the disaster? The disaster was this is not a centrally run, centrally planned company. There are certain things that we are going to do from headquarters but most of the company, quote unquote, which is to the point of learning what is the company, the company is people connecting with other people that they trust and respect and that are working on similar challenges and problems. It is not me telling you, Michael, what life is like in Warsaw or Krakow or wherever you may be. It is you coming together with other people from Poland uh, or the Ukraine or wherever right. and saying, this is our local community and this is how we're going to support each other while we are connected to the global community. So... We fired all of these chapter heads. Uh, we thought we were seeing slow growth before. We saw massive contraction as a consequence of firing them. They are also our, effectively our field sales team and not just, you know, our business grows through word of mouth. So we, you need local people that have, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they feel a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. for yeah. sharing what they do and what they're working on. So the point is we killed our biggest growth engine heading into a very difficult recession. And that was a massive mistake. And we could have renegotiated with the top people and said, hey, we just want new chapter heads. And instead we had to throw the entire system out. And that was a mistake. That was a very, very big mistake. And so, um, yeah, that was one of the, that was one of, and what did that come from? What was the foundational mistake before that? The foundational mistake is we're too big for me to not make data-driven decisions. That's not enough anymore. I can't just do everything on my impulse and my intuition. We need to think twice and measure twice and cut once. And we cannot make massively impulsive decisions that have business impact, ex existential business impact without really thinking, deliberating and being careful about it. So that was one of the mistakes. Yeah. And that's why you need a long term planning, as you just said. Hmm. All right. And then before I let you go, one Quick question, just to to finish off on the on a good positive note, um, importance of gratitude to yourself. Um, Sam, what do you appreciate yourself for? Well, I uh, oh, what do I appreciate myself for? I'm a very good dog dad. I'll say that. Uh, I and I will be a great human dad when the time presents itself. I. I fancy that I am truly willing to be authentic and honest and share my experiences in a way that other people often don't. And I mean it. I mean everything that I'm saying that I've said to you. And that's what I pride myself on. I'm, uh, I think I'm a pretty good friend. And I think that when I'm not being a good friend or a good partner, I'm willing to hear the feedback and I'm willing to improve. Uh, and that's because I have a reasonable, because I love myself and I know that there's no harm and I don't lose anything by admitting that I'm wrong or that I need to improve. And uh, I think I can write pretty good songs and um, I'm becoming a decent cook. Sam, thank you so much for open and honest conversation. It's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks for having me, Michael. And uh, if folks want to reach out to me, you're out there listening, uh, email me, sam at joinpavilion.com. Happy to help or answer questions. 